Welcome back. Next up is Paul from Elliot, an IoT systems integrator, and they're going to tell you all about the awesome use cases they are supporting with LoRaWAN. Enjoy his talk. Hello. Welcome to my talk at the Things Conference 2021. What I want to talk about today is what to look for when choosing a LoRaWAN device and how to make your choices. My name is Paul Hayes and I'm from All IoT Technologies. So what, this all about, what is this all about? So LoRaWAN is a maturing technology. If you go back a few years, then if you were to ask the same question, you'd be thinking about which programming environment do you want to use, whether that's an Arduino or ARM Embed or something like that. These days, LoRaWAN is so popular around the world that there's a huge array of manufacturers making finished devices that you can use and sensors. Um, so it's a, it can be quite difficult to, to make your choices and in a lot of cases, multiple manufacturers will be making devices that perform the same jobs. And how do you choose which one of those to go for? So very quick introduction. So I'm Paul Hayes, uh, technical director for all IoT technologies. And we're a European distributor specializing in LoRaWAN. We've been going about three years now. And uh, so far, our entire focus is LoRaWAN. Uh, all IoT Technologies has well over 100 devices on our portfolio now. A great many of those have just been added to the portfolio when we've gone out and found them to, um, to meet people's particular needs. So customers come to us with, with a problem to solve. They'll want to, they'll want to find a device that will do a certain task and we go and find that for them. And we've got a team of knowledgeable sales and technical people and we do a lot of testing and we do a lot of work with manu various manufacturers of LoRaWAN devices around the world. So how do you find a device that's going to do a specific task? Sometimes that's really easy. So if you want to measure air uh, temperature, then there's loads of temperature sensors around. Almost any company making LoRaWAN sensors will sell you a, a temperature sensor. That's fairly easy to actually identify the device you need. Sometimes that's a lot harder though. So if you want to measure bin levels, if you want to measure water flow in a gully, what type of devices can you actually find to do those things? Well, there's no simple answer to that really. Every, every single job is going to be different. But the advice I can give you is speak to other people. The, the benefits of the popularity of LoRaWAN mean that there's lots of people will have quite likely solved the problem that you're looking at already. You can use events like this, you can Google search, look at manufacturers' websites. Don't try and reinvent the wheel and talk to the experts. Talk to whoever your suppliers are. Use the networking opportunities at events such as this. And look for use cases as well. So manufacturers, distributors, hardware suppliers, whoever they might be, uh, they all love use cases. Uh, and they can be a, a valuable source of finding devices that can, that can solve the problems you've got. But sometimes no one's done the problem, no one's done what you're trying to do. And you've just got to use a mixture of common sense and some trial and error. So once you've identified what devices you want and you've identified a couple of suppliers perhaps, or maybe just one, then you need to test it. So first of all, you've got to get the device obviously, so you usually end up having to buy it. Uh, the next thing is you've then got to configure it, so you've got to get it sending data to say the things network, then you've got to decode that data. So the LoRaWAN sensor will be sending the data in just hexadecimal bytes. You've got to actually then translate that into a temperature or humidity or whatever it is. Um, fortunately, a lot of manufacturers and suppliers now have pre-made decoders written in JavaScript or some other language that you can just use to decode that data straight away. Uh, or failing that, there'll at least be documentation to allow you to make your own. Or us, for example, have lots of decoders that we can that we can give to people to use for testing devices. Um, once you've got the device, then it's really a case of identifying whether it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. And to identify whether something is doing what what it's supposed to be doing, you've got to apply a bit of scientific method. So you need to be able to make predictions about what should happen. Case in point, temperature sensor. You've read the documentation and it says that the device should send a message every 15 minutes. 
and the spec sheet says that the temperature should be should have an accuracy of 1.5 degrees plus or minus so you can you can test that you can compare that with thermometers you've got in the same controlled environment you can just compare it with with other devices you've got that are giving you the, the temperature in the environment you're in and compare does this device match within that level of accuracy that, that might seem quite crude on the face of it but for something like air quality monitoring you're not getting thousandth of a degree accuracy you just you just it just doesn't it just doesn't come into it 1.5 degrees is fairly typical and you can test that fairly easily another example if you have something along the lines of say a water valve and you know that that should open within x minutes of queuing a downlink message because the device is sending uplinks at x minutes intervals then you can just observe it and does it do what it says it does and is that repeatable uh, ambient light sensor for example so you can make predictions on whether when the light levels should be going up and when they should be going down based on sunrise and sunset um, and you can observe whether that's whether that's really happening GPS tracker is it giving the coordinates it should be giving put the coordinates into Google Maps and see what location it's giving you see whether that remains accurate um, here's some examples for, for of some testing I've done in a by sending some data through to Grafana graphing application which is, is well worth using something like that because when it comes to testing devices visualizing the data really helps you to be able to tell what's going on so there for example with that light level sensor I can see that in the daytime the light level is clearly going up and it's clearly staying down at night it's what I'm expecting to happen carbon dioxide there um, typically you'll find in in an office environment where that is when there's people in the office the carbon dioxide will rise throughout the day and then when they go home at night it will gradually fall to us to a sort of base level and you can see there in that graph that pretty much fits that model um, what you can't really see is because it's partially covered by my picture there but is at the weekend there's it's just staying at the base level all the time which is, is good that's what I'm expecting because I know I knew that there's no people in the office at that time so that's kind of matching what I expect to happen um, to test the things you've got to put them into sort of real world environments so there's no point testing a carbon dioxide sensor in a room where there's never any people or the carbon dioxide is never going to change because there's not, not a huge amount of point to that um, testing a valve opener for example I'll show you what I've got here so in order to test this valve opener device which is a class C lower one device that's powered so I just went to my local hardware shop and bought a bought a ball valve there to connect this and I have a couple of bits of copper pipe just in my garage that I've attached that to so I can actually I can actually test that in in what's kind of a real world application it's actually operating a real valve like it should do in, in production rather than just having it sat on my desk not really doing anything I can actually test is it really going to open and close a valve and how long does it take? Um, testing is not not a quick job. You can't rush it. You've got to you've got to spend at least a few days getting some data from your device to tell whether it's it's reliably doing what it should be doing. But it's it's necessary. Someone needs to be able, needs to test this device to to test so that you can trust. Is the data that's coming out of it is it reliable? And is it going to tell me what I'm expecting it to tell me? So. I'm going to talk about battery life separately as well because this is one of the sort of big areas of concern with LoRaWAN. Everyone talks about batteries that last five years or ten years, but in what conditions are those numbers? So when a manufacturer says my sensor lasts five years, what spreading factor is that? Because that has a huge difference between seven spreading factor seven and spreading factor twelve. You can be talking twenty-four times the amount of airtime. That has a massive effect on battery life. What uplink period is it sending messages every 15 minutes every six hours because so that again has a massive difference on battery life um, obviously you can't you can't just test it you can't just sit there for 10 up 10 years and wait for the batteries to run out and see whether they really do that last long it's just it's just not possible but you can do a few things you can you can set the uplink period to be much shorter than, than you would do in production 
Um, obviously, make sure you're sticking to fair use policies and, and local restrictions in whatever area you're in. Um, but you can you can set the uplink period to be very short and then do some simple testing and see whether the results you're getting, whether the battery level is staying sensible. Speak to other people who've used the device as well. That's really important. If you can find other people who've been using this device for a couple of years, they'll be able to tell you are the batteries lasting. And also ask the manufacturer what testing they did and can you see the reports on battery life. And then some common cells can help you as well. So if you've got a device that's just got a small 1.5 volt AA battery, that's highly unlikely to last years in a lower one sensor. Similarly for rechargeable batteries, they're not going to last a long time because they will self-discharge, which is why most lower one sensors won't have rechargeable batteries in them. So the other side to this is how do you assess the supply chain? Who are you, who are you buying these from? Who's the manufacturer? What's the history of the manufacturer and what track record do they have of making devices that last years? What track record do they have at, at being able to scale? So if you start off wanting you generally start off with a proof of concept you want a small number of devices but then it could be that this then starts to grow and you might end up needing to buy thousands of devices in at a time is the manufacturer capable of doing this and um, or are they just going to let you down and really the, the things there you, you've just got to speak to them and ask them the right questions and then try and gauge whether they whether they appear to have thought about these things and whether they know what they're talking about so Ask the questions, put hypothetical situations to them. So you tell them you want, if you want to order forty thousand devices in batches of two thousand a month, what would the lead times be? How would they actually work? What would the, how would they need paying for that? Um, and you should be able to get a reasonable idea of whether they've at least thought about these things or whether it appears to be a question they've never been asked before. But I would say, really, please don't rule out startup manufacturers and new manufacturers because there's a huge amount of them in the in lower one it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that they're any worse or better at this than than any of the big companies either um just talk to them and then do they do the product you want to buy have whatever relevant approvals you need so if you're in if you're in europe then they'll need ce certification do they have that if you're selling into say the gas industry do they have atex rating FCC for US, etc. And um, ask to see the certificates as well. Actually ask for some proof of this as well to make sure that these devices have the um, have this certification. And then who in the supply chain is holding stock? So is anybody holding stock for that matter? Or is it every time you're wanting to buy these devices, is it going to be manufacturer to order? So that could be a manufacturer or it could be a distributor. One of the things all IoT does is we hold we hold levels of stock. Uh, and where is that stock? Is it at the other side of the world? How quickly can can it be got to you? What what are the lead times going to be? Um, international shipping can take a long time. Get price breaks as well. So that's another good gauge of a supplier is have they actually thought about the pricing for for larger jobs and when these things start to scale. Because your customer won't expect to pay the same for a thousand devices as they are doing for five. So does the manufacturer understand that and do they have pricing? And whoever's importing these things, do they know what paperwork's involved? Um, we have a lot of experience of that being based in the UK since it's suddenly become a lot more difficult than it used to be. Um, what's the warranty on the device as well? Often overlooked by uh, manufacturers is how does the warranty get handled unfortunately things will fail from time to time and is the does the manufacturer have a decent process for handling that so just to summarize then really what you should be thinking about is how to avoid choosing devices that are just going to fail or don't do what they're supposed to do or you suddenly find that they're not available when you your customers suddenly wanting to order five thousand of these things from you and really, it's everything that we've spoken about. Um, and I would also, as a last point, let just say it always helps to have options. So find multiple suppliers. If you're searching for a carbon dioxide sensor for indoor air quality monitoring, 
have a couple of different options. So I have a preferred one and then have a backup plan in case something goes wrong. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I hope you found it useful. Uh, any questions that you have, please, please feel free to send me an email and um, get in touch and we can, we can talk you through all this process in more detail and help you find whatever it is you want to find. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.